Hello everyone, welcome back to Powerful Nothing, a Magic the Gathering podcast. This is episode 2, and we're on part 2 of our set review for March of the Machines. We're going to be looking at the set specifically for Cube. In this episode, we're going to be looking at green, multicolored, and artifacts. A link will be down in the description to part one, where we've spoken about everything else, including where we give some hot takes on our thoughts on battles. If you haven't listened to that one, check that one out first, and then come back here. We have a ton of cool cards to talk about today, and to help me out, I'm once again joined by James. How is it going, dude? Yeah, it's going good. It's going good, man. With um, having one week on from previous set of you, we have now paid with these cards in paper as well. Mm -hmm. So we're one free release into the format. But there can confirm that there's a powerful and definitely some cube worthy ones in there, I think. Yep, fantastic. Yeah, always good to have you back. Uh, look, James, you want to take it away with our first green card? Certainly will. First up, we have Deep Root Wayfinder. It is one green for a two free creature Merfolk Scout. And it has, whenever Deep Root Wayfinder deals combat damage to a player or battle, surveil one. Then you may return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And this card, it, for a 2-drop, this does a lot. Great stats, first up. 2-3 two, for 2 mana, really strong. Um, this combat damage ability is really powerful. Um, there's nothing bad to say about this card. The fact that it's, it's not just... Like you reveal the top card, it goes into if you hit a land, it goes into place any land from your graveyard. So this can be like a strip mine you've hit from with earlier, it could be a fetch land, whatever. Um The issue I have with it is I kind of don't know where it goes. Because the um the landsy decks that you'd normally associate with this sort of ability, they're very much looking to play on the back foot most of the time until you know they'll be defending themselves. They'll look like they're losing the game until they go and do something busted on turn five. They're not really looking to beat down their cheap creatures. They want to block with their creatures. Um, and they tend to not have a bunch of cheap removal to get this guy through your opponent's blockers to enable it. Um, now listen, there'll be games where it'll be great, right? You'll be playing against a control deck with your Landy deck. Um, they don't have a creature on board. If they can't answer this, it's going to start hitting them. You, that, that trigger is really powerful, as I say. Um, but I think there'll be a lot of games where that's not the case. Um, so outside of that obvious sort of landsy home, it's obviously just like a fine mid-range two-drop, but that's, um, you know, green-based mid-range isn't something we're generally super into. And then, um, and then you're getting down to, like, Merfolk Tribal, which, I mean, sure, it's definitely one of the best Merfolk, but, you know... Um, this is not an archetype in many cubes. Um, listen, maybe maybe the rate is so pushed that you can just jam it in a lot of decks and it's fine because when you get to connect with it, it's really good. But I, I do kind of have my doubts about where this goes. No, I think that's fair. Um, as a body, just the rate is very good. In terms of where it sits, I do agree with you. It is a bit tricky. Like For me, it kind of sits in between two decks and that's oddly where it could see place if you're supporting... Two types, of, two types of strategy. So obviously, you, obviously, you have the land strategy, as you kind of spoken about. It the fact it does also surveil means that it you could it could see some play in decks that are trying to fill up the graveyard. Just get a good aggressive creature down early and just start swinging, and then use your graveyard for value. Because like, uh, yeah, I agree. It's kind of like it's it's not as good as creatures that do either that are dedicated to do either of those things. Like, there's better creatures that bring lands back from your graveyard. Like, this one actually kind of uh, compares to like uh, Ernest Gloom Stalker from one of the Commander Legends. I don't know if that one does, but that's like a two and a green for a 3-3 three, three Death Touch that when it attacks, you get a land back to the battlefield specifically untapped. Like That is definitely better in the lands deck. And there's definitely versions of this which kind of will put more cards into your graveyard. Like um, what's the one green green one from original Ixalan um, that like surveils twice or something like that? Oh, there's one that explores twice. That's it. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that one. So like, that's definitely, like, both of those two cards are better in their respective decks. But this is a bit of a crossover between the two. So I could see it maybe having a place if you are supporting both of those things and you're looking for a bit of, like, crossover, a little kind of flexibility in your creatures, while also just being a perfectly fine creature in itself. It's a fine body. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you could just do something, if you could just, like, tap to do something similar to this ability, I'd be really into yeah. it. But it's, yeah, it's the fact you have to attack with it um, that makes it kind of tough for me. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. 
All right, let's move on to our first battle of the day. We have Invasion of Ikoria. Um, it costs X green green and comes in with six defense counters on it. When Invasion of Ikoria enters the battlefield, search your library and or graveyard for a non-human creature card with mana value X or less and put it onto the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle. And once this battle is defeated, just a quick reminder with battles, these flip when the last counter is removed from them. Normally, that is through damage of some kind, but spoiler, where I'm thinking about this card, you can take them off in other ways. Yeah, and just a quick note, when we use flip with these battles, we're kind of shorthanding through, but you do actually cast free transform side is a thing that is worth remembering. Um, so they can potentially let you attack their battle and then counter the, ba the other side of the battle once it is cast. Yeah, that's a tremendous feel bad. That, like, that, that didn't come up at pre-release, I'm assuming because the, like, the level of counter spells is not that much, but in cube, it's definitely a thing to remember with battles. It could definitely come up. It can flip into Zilthora, Apex of Ikoria, which is an 8-8 legendary creature dinosaur with reach, and it has the ability for each non-human creature you control, you may have that creature assign its combat damage as though it weren't blocked. So, Invasion of Ikoria, what do you think? So, we've seen tutors like this before. We have cards like Finale of Devastation, or like maybe like Green Sun Zenith. I think cards like that do have a place in cube. Green can be quite toolboxy when it wants to, and these are really good at finding not only your utility creatures, like your scavenging news or your reclamation stages, but, but then if you have enough mana, you can just go find your win con. Like, paying six mana for a questing beast is still good a fair chunk of the time. So my kind of hope with this is that like at its base level, it's another version of those. Like Finale of Devastation is very expensive. Um, flipping this, again, the backside of this, I do think is quite interesting. Like if you've ever played with rocks before, I think that's the that's the rhino that, or Loxodon maybe, I, I can't remember how the wording of that card is, but um, the ability to assign damage straight to opponents if it weren't wasn't blocked is very scary. Um, and this is an 8-8, so... If you can flip this, it's basically eight unblockable damage. Um, the the bad side of the card is defense six is quite a lot. Like you are in green and you, in theory, have just got a big dumb creature out to go swing through with it. There could be a world where you try and get we try and get this, and then the next turn you alpha strike with the board you already have, and you're effectively eight eight unblockable. What actually interests me about this card, and one of the reasons I actually might test it is that some cubes will already be running Dark Depths combo with Dark Depths and then potentially Vampire Hex Mage as a way of taking counters off it. Vampire Hex Mage doesn't... Like, it's a fine creature, but it's definitely been kind of outclassed. Um, it's interaction where you can... Because of the wording with battles, it happens when you remove the last counter from it. So in theory, you could pay four mana, go get your Vampire Hex Mage out of your deck, sacrifice it to take the counters of this and then on turn four you have this 8-8 eight, eight unblockable-esque thing that is quite scary and i think that is quite an interesting combo and that's kind of it pushes this card just above the regular ones that we've already seen because of that little interaction it's a tutor that kind of for four mana can get you an 8-8 eight, eight. that's quite cool i quite like that yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point, actually. I hadn't thought of the Vampire Hex Mage interaction. And there's also a certain amount of natural synergy in there because if you have Vampire Hex Mage as one of your combo pieces with Dark Depths and you've drawn your Dark Depths, then you can just use this to go and get the Hex Mage and have a 20-20. Um, so it, it sort of plays well whether you've drawn the Dark Depths or not. Um, yeah, I, I quite I like this card a lot. Um I think the, the finale comparison is close. I, I was I was pretty on board with this just being better than finale until I read the I read it for a second time and saw the words non human. Um non human does cut off like like it is quite annoying with a certain amount of the like both combo pieces and utility creatures that you would want to get in your toolboxy style deck. Uh, so, for, like, for example, you can get your Viscerous here with this. You couldn't get your Vizier of Remedies with this. Um, but yeah, I think, the, I think the battle is very meaningful. Like, this is kind of a better sort of fair card in a lot of ways. Um, because, yeah, you know, if you play this and then you you know, play questing beasts and hit the battle, you're you're in pretty good shape. Or hit the opponent and hit the battle, I guess. Um yeah, no, I think strong card for sure. Sweet, awesome. All right, do you want to take it away with our second battle of the day? Yeah, next up we have the invasion of Ixalan. 
It is one green for a four defense battle siege. When Invasion of Ixalan enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a permanent card from among them and put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of the li your library in a random order. So this is kind of a fillery two mana cantrip. Uh, but the backside is once you've dealt four damage to it, it flips into Belligerent Regisaur, which is a 4 free creature dinosaur with trample. And whenever you cast a spell, Belligerent Regisaur gains indestructible until end of turn. And that's a very real threat. Um, you can normally, you'll be able to play your spells pre-combat if this is in play. So you can, you know, creature will essentially be indestructible in combat most of the time. Um, so we're not excited about the front half, just as a cantrip. That's, you know, we see like, advent, even as like Adventurous Impulse is, is more, much more efficient than that card. Um, so is the payoff of this 4-3 once you dealt 4 damage to it good enough? I, I think in the right deck it will be. Um, I think this is kind of low-key a card for sort of red-green monsters style of deck because they have a lot of good hasty creatures. A lot of them actually have 4 power. Like, you see, you've got Questing Beast, you've got the um, red dinosaur in this set. Minsk and Boo is phenomenal with this. Um, or after this, it even finds you your Minsk and Boo. Um, like, that's such a huge swing if you get to, on turn four, you play your huge hasty creature that's already a massive threat. Now you have this extra 4 3 as well. I think that's very much worth it. Um, but it is kind of, I think, mostly that deck. And, like, you don't want this in, like, a green ramp deck. You don't want it really in, like, a multicolor, more controlling green deck. You don't want it in a green lands deck. You you do need to be, like, on the front foot for this card to be playable, I think. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think there is definitely room for maybe one or two of the kind of, like, uh, these kind of find a uh, land or creature in the f in the top couple you can probably get away with running one maybe two at most in like larger cubes and so yeah in the past i've run like abundant harvest i know people have run once upon a time that has the added bonus of being free if it's the first spell you cast i find with green having that little bit of card advantage but yeah unless you are heavily pushing gruel monsters this might not have a place and then even then should you be running a card for just that's just for one color in your mono green section? I think that's probably the tricky part of the card. Yeah, that's fair. It's um yeah, I mean I suppose it's not like a complete disaster if you end up putting this in your lands deck or whatever, right? And it's permanent, so you know like planeswalks and stuff as well. But I think Gruel Monsters is the only place where you're happy about it. I think everywhere else you'll be, it's like reluctantly playable. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like, like that's the only one where where, where realistically you're you, the the backside is like a thing that you can do quickly enough and it becomes relevant. Whereas otherwise in the rest of them, it's just kind of like a, a worse version of the other effects that, that we've already spoken about. Yeah, for sure. I think the only other place you could potentially see it having home is, it is worth noting with battles and it's especially relevant for cheap ones, I think, that you can flick of them and, and get the ETB mm -hmm. again. Um, but green is just the wrong colour for that, you know? Like, if it was in blue or white, I think that's a much more relevant part of the card. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, green can be played in flicker colours, but it's more you're flickering your Thrag Tusk, not this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're happier so... with that. Yeah. <laughs> you're never unhappy <laughs> if you're flickering a Thrag Tusk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right, let's... All right, I'll take it away with our next green card. We have Kami of Whispered Hopes. It is two and a green for a 1-1 one, one creature spirit. If one or more plus one plus one counters would be put on a permanent you control, that many plus one plus one plus one counters are put on that permanent instead. It also has tap to add X mana of any one color where X is Kami Whispered Hope's power. So this is a, I think actually a pretty solid card. Um, the top ability of that is like another version of like a hardened scale of effects. It's good at buffing the amount of counters going onto your creatures. This one has specifically been worded, I think, to work with incubate tokens as hardened scales just says creatures. So the fact this says permanence means that it works with the synergy in the set, basically. But in games, they'll effectively function the same way. Um, the bottom ability, I think, is fine. It's okay uh, as some fixing, but it obviously gets better once you put a counter on it, because um, obviously this will this will buff its, its own power. So one counter on this means that suddenly this starts tapping for three mana. That 
is much better. You're much happier once you've got the first counter on to, onto it. This doesn't put counters on anything, so it obviously only goes into cubes where you are already supporting a plus one plus one counter archetype. And the fact that this is a creature means it probably there's an argument that it can go in as well as hardened scales because also because hardened scales is a one mana enchantment by itself does not do anything. At least this could kill an opponent with the counters that you're putting onto it or or, or are being put onto it. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is that this is a mono green card. Previously, we have seen these effects, but they're in like guild colors, so like things like Winding Constrictor with black, or by adding white to it with Conclave Mentor. I like the fact that, that this is being a single color does free up your guild slots for other things. And also importantly, it is an uncommon. In Peasant Cubes with plus ones on counter synergies, I think this will be very strong, and that will it will definitely see a lot of play in those cubes. Um, what's your take, James? Do you think it kind of can push beyond uh, Peasant Cube? Or I think it's interesting. It's it's definitely, if you want to do this plus one something as an archetype, um, like, you do just need that amount of redundancy, right? And, um, like, I think for most of those decks that are really all in on the plus one plus one counters thing, they're not going that high on the mana curve, so it's like the mana's not amazing there probably most of the time, and you're much happier with, like, actual factual hardened scales or um, the... Uh, there's a Golgari and a Selesnia creature that do the same thing. Um, Winding Constructor. Um, but just having more of that effect is a good thing for that deck. Um, but I think it's nice that if you put it in for that deck, like it will other, also find other spots to be good with the mana ability. Like You, you can't really just play like three mana, tap for mana if you don't have any other synergies. That's not good. But the... Um, but it's but you will have in a lot of spots incidental ways in your deck to increase its power without being like super all in on the plus one plus one counter thing. Like it tells you to do it with plus one plus one counter. You can do it with other stuff. You know you can um, use pump spells or plane spawners. It wears a bone splitter. Yeah, yeah bone splitter, fantastic, love it. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's got some spots. I think it's got some spots to be good. I think it's not going in like most cubes, uh, but yeah, peasant it seems great. And um, yeah, if you're really doing that plus one plus one factors thing, it definitely seems like worth a spot. All right, awesome. Do you want to take it away with our first praetor of the day? Why not? Okay, let's do some reading. Um, <laughs> so first praetor of the day is Vorinclex. It is three green green for a legendary creature Phyrexian Praetor. It's a 6-6 six, six with Trample and Reach. Also has the ability, when Vorinclex enters the battlefield, search your library for up to two forest cards, reveal them and put them into your hand, then shuffle. Notably, this is forest, not basic forest, so you can get your, your dual lands with types. And it also has another ability, of course. Uh, six green green. You can exile Vorinclex, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control, activate only as a sorcery. So notably, all the other Praetors has an additional requirement to fulfill to flip them. This one, the requirement is you have eight mana. Um... But it does flip into something good. It flips into the Grand Evolution, which is a saga, the first chapter of which is mill 10 cards. Then you put up to two creature cards from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. Chapter 2 is distribute 7 plus 1 plus 1 counters among any number of target creatures you control. And the final chapter is, until end of turn, creatures you control gain the ability to pay one mana. This creature fights target creature you don't control. And finally, as part of that third chapter, you exile the Grand, Le Revolu the grand Evolution pardon me, and return it to the battlefield front face up. So you get another Vorinclex. Um, listen, obviously this is a powerful card. Um, there's a lot of text. It's all good text. Um, so, assuming we do know of a work, free green green, six six, trample reach, get two forests, put them into your hand. 
it's not a horrible deal. Um, it's a really good roadblock. Like the reach is really nice here. Um, and obviously, if you're ahead, it's it's a hell of a beta. Um, it's not like the best at being that that big five drop, right? Um, you know, if you compare this in terms of like how quickly it's going to snowball game on its own to like five mana Nissa, for example, you'd rather have a Nissa, I think, in most spots. Um, so you have to be like using those extra forests you're getting. Um, remember, not into play, but into your hand. But um, this this doesn't want this isn't a card that wants to be the top of your curve. I'd say you want what this wants to do is help you get to your like seven and eight drops. And but conveniently, this is also an eight drop when you don't draw your other seven and eight drops because the saga is pretty powerful. Um, it's not an 8-drop like Crater of Behemoth is an 8-drop for, you know. It's not like winning either game straight away will take a couple of turns, but um, but it is powerful, and you won't be able to really grind through this in a long game. Um, what's all that add up to? I think it's okay. Um, I don't know how well it stacks up against, um, like, green 5-drops is a pretty competitive slot. Um, I I don't see this being the best of them. I think because like a couple of the planeswalkers are stronger, um, but I think it's fine. Yeah, I'm also having a little bit of trouble, um, not not evaluating, but just kind of finding the the slot for this that isn't just the another payoff for big mono green, which is kind of a bit weird because I've been and, and I think a lot of people have kind of been moving away from mono green as the archetype. Just or as an archetype, kind of like, yes, you can still have big green being a thing, but just like having someone who is drafting all of the mana dorks, Rafelos, yeah, Gaia's Cradle, like, like that just hasn't been as strong. Like, you kind of you want to play Minsk and Blue, you want to play like, like in Powerful Give, you want to play like Oko or Blue cards, like those kind of do stronger things. And it's kind of a bit weird that kind of like, I mean, maybe Wizards have noticed that because we had uh, the, the Nissa with Phyrexian mana from the last set. Which seem to be a payoff from on a green, and we have this as well. Like, yeah, like I think the backside of this is extremely strong, and I think what would get this into a cube over another five drop is the idea that you can play this, and then within a turn or two, you are doing the backside. Because I kind of read the three backsides as all three of those should, in theory, be winning you the game. Mill ten cards. If you if if you're in that big, big green deck, it's not guaranteed, but you you could hit your Woodfall Primus or your trust on there. If that doesn't work, you get another shot with putting the counters on something, swinging through with that. If that doesn't work, you just start fighting their board, and then this flips back on the same term, and you already have eight mana, so you can just do it again. Like, yeah, I don't disagree. Like, I think if I had a fellow deck, like, yeah, maybe this is probably pretty good, but I, I kind of agree. I don't think that deck's fit that good anymore. Um, and then I suppose you could argue the fact that it doesn't get basic forest means that this this can play in a multicolor deck as well. But um, at that point, you know, you start comparing it to like if you're splashing other colors, like do I want this or Omnath? Do I want Omnath? Do I want this or Minskinbu? Minskinbu, you know. Um, yeah, like powerful cards you can play it if you want. Um, I don't think it's like anything to write home about though, really. No, no, exactly. It is definitely a card that I think has suffered from the archetype that it is probably best in not being super strong in the most competitive cubes. And and, and there, there will still be cubes where mono green is still good. It's, it's still a thing. Like, And in those, yeah, this could see a place. But yeah, I think in a lot of cubes and a, a lot of kind of cubes that are keeping updated with current cards and stuff, this, this has less of a place than it would have a couple of years ago, basically. Yeah, for sure. Right, let's take it away with a Planeswalker. We have Ren and Realmbreaker. It is one green-green for a four starting loyalty legendary Planeswalker Ren. There's the static ability of lands you control have tap to add one mana of any color. It has a plus one. Up to one target land you control becomes a 3-3 three, three elemental creature with vigilance, hexproof, and haste until your next turn. It is still a land. There's a minus two of mill three cards. You may put a permanent card from among the mill cards into your hand. And a minus seven, you get an emblem with you may play lands and cast permanent spells from your graveyard. So all the abilities on this I like. Uh, also, it being a three-mana planeswalker that upticks to five is good. The static fixing all of your colors is obviously very nice. The five-color nonsense deck will just love that. Um, 
the plus one is fine. Um, it sort of protects itself. There has been a lot of discourse already on that plus one because it doesn't untap the land, meaning that if you play this on turn three on an empty board, it's not protected. Realistic though, realistically though, I think this is more like it's, I think it's more likely you play this on like turn two with help from a mana dork when your opponent either doesn't have anything to attack you with, or you play it on turn three with a mana dork and leave a land up to protect it. You turn the land you haven't tapped. Um, that part I actually don't think is the end of the world. I don't think it's a big deal because it, it, it is going to be on five if it does get attacked. Like it, this isn't going to die on turn th- three, basically. Um, the minus two, I think, is solid. Self mill decks exist. This is going to like that as well. Um, the minus seven is really fun. It does take four turns for you to get to, but while it doesn't win you the game on the spot, it will probably win you the game over the next ten minutes or so. So because this doesn't go, just go into land based decks, but it has some pl- has a little bit of play in graveyard decks, I do think there will be a crossover for this. Um, we have been testing this for a couple of drafts now. I think I swapped out Dryad of the Lysian Grove for this. I'm not sure if that's correct, but they kind of fill the same role for me, basically. Um, but I think Ren and Realmbreaker has a way higher upside than the sexy tree nymph. So that's kind of why I made the decision. Um, what do you think, James? What's your take on Ren and Realmbreaker? Yeah, I think those points are all fair. The, um, if you want it to protect itself right away, if a board demands that, it kind of costs four mana, right? Would just would be the, the way that plus works. Um but you can also just, you know, you play it if they want to, and you just minus two, and you got a bit of value anyway, right? Um, obviously, that's not how you want to use it, but sometimes that's how you'll have to use it, and that's fine. Um, the fixing is great, but it, it'd be a lot higher on it if it costs two and a green. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, yeah. It, the five color decks are generally base green anyway, but double green could still be quite greedy yeah double green on on free mana is requiring you to have like 10 green sources um so it's like well you could stack your deck full of green sources and then when you have this your mana will all be amazing but when you don't you have too many green sources and not enough of your other colors um so I think I think there's a certain amount of tension there. Um, I don't think that makes the card bad, but um, I, I think it's like a notable downside of it versus like something like Dryad, which goes in like a much wider variety of decks. I think. Um, but this is this is just a lot of value over time for very cheap mana costs. Like free mana plays walkers are just good. If your opponent doesn't have a fast start and you you play a walker, especially on turn two off a dork, which obviously goes great with this mana cost. Um, that's really powerful. That can snowball a game in terms of card advantage very quickly. Um, I don't think this really this isn't the like aggressive free mana walker like like that that plus will deal for your turn, but it's not. Um, I don't think the way you normally will want to use this card is um, is like just plus every turn hit them for free. I think you'll you'll want to be using that minus two most of the time. Um, I do instead of it, really like the the hex proof on the land on the the plus. I think that makes it like a lot more palatable to actually use that ability because it can be kind of a disaster otherwise if you plus and they just like bolt your land and kill your planeswalker. Yeah, a, a board wipe will still suck, but it's not the as much of the feel bad as just like Doomblade, Lightning Bolt, that kind of thing. That would be much worse. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and the vigilance, I guess, means that it can still attack and then you can play stuff in your second main phase. That is that part is nice as well. Yep, for sure. All that's up. All right, next up we have Baval and Karizev, which is one a blue and a red for a legendary creature human. It is a 2-4 with First Strike and Menace. And whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, you may cast a spell with lesser mana value that shares a card type with it from your hand without paying its mana cost. If you don't, create First Maked Ragavan, a legendary 2-1 red monkey pirate creature token. It gains haste until end of turn. Notably, the Ragvan doesn't go away at end of turn. It just gains haste. You get to keep that Ragvan, 
but obviously it is legendary, so you're not pumping out multiple of these creatures. But you can like trade it off for value or whatever, and then just make another one. Um, I think that's the main part of what this card does. I, I, it's like it will come up that you get value out of that. Um, the casting a spell with less of mana value. Um, like you know, you can maybe you leave up like your, you no know, Archmage's charm. Um and you get to counter that thing and you pay your impulse for free and you've got a little bit of a man of advantage and that'll be like situationally cute but it, i don't think it's actually a major part of the card like it's it's not going to be that frequent that, that actually lines up that way um so i think we're mostly about making this two one and just having a creature with like some good keywords um i, I don't really see this as quite good enough in most decks to be honest um if you compare this, just all the other spells pay off. The, um, you know, I'd rather have a young Pyromancer. I'd rather have a um, a third path iconoclast. I'd rather have the shark from this set that pumps out tokens. Um, I I think you can do better just because you only get one of those two ones. It's not gonna it's not gonna snowball in the same way. Um, like first strike menace is nice. It means it's really hard to block. It means it's good at blocking. Uh, but the stats mean it didn't get bolted, but I, I think it kind of just doesn't have enough of a impact. It doesn't let you snowball in the way you'd want your spells pay off to. No, exactly. No, I do completely agree that I kind of I I I think this is not one for higher powered cubes. I could see this in more budget cubes. Um primarily like if I'm honest, mainly in like in a slower deck, like this is quite a roadblock, like Three mana, two, four, first strike, if you ignore the menace because you're blocking with it, that like when you cast your instant on their turn, you also make a two one blocker. Yeah. And from their point of view, anytime you trade with that Ragavan, it's just a disaster, isn't it? Okay, I'm gonna compare a I am gonna do the thing where I compare a good card to this card again. But like this is like a budget version of something like Thing in the Ice for like a for a more budget environment like it's i think the ice costs two man and kind of just and wipes that board <laughs> all right and thing in the ice is only three pounds so yeah all right <laughs> all right uh... shell out the extra one pound yeah, fifty yeah. get a thing in the ice <laughs> <laughs> no that's fair yeah you yeah, know it is a, this is a tricky card because like yeah well, i mean i was trying to evaluate like like the first like the ability to kind of copy your spells is will come up so much less than you think it will and you'll also be kind of like probably playing magic worse trying to get the value off of it like one of the best things about instances you can cast them whenever you want if you're trying to set up a thing where you're getting the most value out of this i might just not cast your instance at, at the opportune moment to do it so yeah i yeah it's a tricky card i could see it in more budget cubes because i do think it I still think in those it it, it could be solid it, it, if you're doing more like is it control, but yeah, in higher powered levels or any kind of thing where you're doing like tempo based, who there is it, it might not might not get there. All right, let's read our next card. We have Boborigmus and Thibblethip. It is two green, blue, and a red for a six five legendary creature, Cyclops Homunculus. Whenever Bobby and Thibblethip enter the battlefield or attacks, draw a card, and you may discard any number of land cards. When you discard one or more cards this way, Bobby and Thibblethip deal twice that much damage to target creature. It also has one in the blue, put Bobberigmus and Thibblethip into its owner's library, third from the top. So, this is a pretty good creature. It is, a, again, a bit tricky to evaluate because cards with three colours in their mar in their casting cost traditionally in cube haven't seen that much play unless you're trying to cheat them in. Um, however, we are in a world where triumphs exist. They have become much more castable but they still have to be worth the extra effort to cast them. Like, if you're going to cast them, they have to be worth it, because it is three colours. It goes in naturally less decks, even when fixing is good. So at a base level, this is five mana for a 6-5, when it enters the battlefield or attacks, draws you a card. That's good. That isn't... That is fine. Um, you can then discard land cards to deal some damage to some creatures. Realistically, that is only really getting rid of, like, smaller creatures i think because most of the time when this has come out you maybe might have one land in hand this does cost five mana in three different colors so this kills an x2 realistically when you're casting it or when it attacks if you do draw a land from the from the draw spell when this enters the battle or attacks um you might get to kill an x4 I would personally it rather have something like Trample than the discard ability. It just comes in, draws you a card, and it's Trample. 
that would be good. Um, the protection part is nice, but it being on layaway for three turns is actually really quite a bit for a card like this, which you then still have to cast it. That all seems very slow when the ability is just draw a card when it comes back, when it comes back in. I'm not massively sold on this, even though I do have a massive soft spot for Borg Morris Enraged. I have tried to force that in cube before, um, but unfortunately, I, I don't think Bob Arigmus and Thibblethip gets there. Um, not for three colors, anyway. What do you think, James? I think I'm a little bit higher on this than you. Um, like, I agree with everything you said about the... Um... The mana cost. But I think the first thing to mention is it just massive as well. Like it's a six five. Um yeah, yeah. I mean it's like it's hard to kill. It's um and it it's gonna have good attacks a lot of the times. And I think I'm a little bit higher on the discarding lands part as well. Um like I'm pretty interested in this in a deck which is returning lands from its graveyard, replaying lands from its graveyard. Um because you know, if you have like Crucible of Worlds in play, for example, you um, it does just mean often you end up with a bunch of lands in hand because you're not playing lands out of your hand. You're playing like your fetch land out of your graveyard or whatever every turn. Um, the same with Ren Six. Um, and yeah, like the fact it's twice for damage means like yeah, you know, if you discard two lands, you're killing a very real creature, right? Um, and it does like, and when you do get to do that, it it's often what those decks need because they tend to fall behind on board while they're messing around playing Crucible of Worlds. Um, so this is like a massive blocker that potentially kills a thing. Like, I don't think it's incredible. Like, you know, even in that deck, it's like worse than Golos and Omnath and whatnot. But it's, um, but I think it's definitely playable. And it's, the other thing is it's just never bad. Like, if you can cast it, this is, I don't think there are many decks that are unhappy with this. Like, it's like it's not as powerful as the you know you compare this to like frost titan for example like i'm aware frost titan's been power crept out of cube a little <laughs> bit yeah. but like this is five mana for like a very pretty similar effect you know like just in terms of like power level um i i think this i, I feel like this is a lot for five i don't know uh, like so i think the three mana the three different colors mana does make a big difference but it just Compare this to the Vorinclex that we just looked at, though, because that's five mana for a 6-6 six, six with keywords that in te that technically draws you two cards. They're both lands. Like, this does have the removal, but then the other one has the upside of... Vorinclex has the upside of, in theory, flipping into, like, a potential win condition. Like, I, I guess the reason I like this... I don't know if I like this more than Vorinclex, but... Um... I, I I rate that this has the attack trigger, so this like snowballs That's a little bit more. Like, it, I I'm not interested in putting this card in my deck if I'm never casting it before turn five, really. Yeah. But um, if I'm ramping this out a bit, this this like has some snowball potential. No, that's fair. Like, if I play this, kill something, get an attack in with it, and like I've drawn two cards, like that's I'm I'm real happy about it. Yeah, you are probably happy at that point. That's fair. Whereas like Vorinclex uh, do doesn't quite snowball in the same way until of course you get to, to eight mana, but that's that's a fair ways away. No, that's fair. Do, um, question on the the deck it goes into. Do you think that kind of that playing uh, stuff from graveyard Lanzi deck is in Tima, or is it or is one of these kind of like, is blue the splash, or is it like a deck where where you're already activating Golos, you're already casting Omnath, this is fine. I generally have quite a lot of colors in those decks, and this is very splashable. Um, yeah, I, I, I think if it's going to be three colors, Teemo is, is the best three for those decks. Um, like, b blue and green tend to be the base, but then, like, red has some, some pretty strong draws in, like, Ren and Six and, and removal and whatnot. No, awesome. No, makes sense. Cool. Do you want to take it away uh, with our next card? Yeah, we'll do. Next up, we have Errant and Giada. It is one, a white and a blue for a legendary creature, human angel. It's a 2 3 with flash and flying. And it has you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast spells with flash or flying from the top of your library. Um, 
notably here, instants are not spells with flash. Uh, this is specifically cards with the word flash on them, not just cards you can play at instant speed. Um, I think this is fine. It's um, of, I think you need like a deck that is about flying creatures for this to be good. Um, I'm not very happy with, or or I guess a slightly low powered cube. But in general, I'm not. I'm not going to be happy with this with like five cards in my deck for it hits. You know, um, I I I I want to be in a deck that is about that. That could be like a straight blue white skies deck. You know, you're playing your favorable wins and whatnot to pump up all your little flyers. Or it could be a um, you know, you could run. This, for example, in um, if you had like spirits tribal in the in the cube, um, like obviously this isn't a spirit, but all the spirits fly, so that might be really good. Um, or like some sort of flash theme. But I, I I think outside of that, like it's just not you're just not going to have the density for this card. Um, like there's some amount of value in just being able to look at the top card, um, but I don't think it's worth card. And like two free flash flyer is is fine for free, but it's not. Um, it's nothing to write home about. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, like th this is very much one for slightly more budget cubes. Where, like, I would be honest, like, um, flies, flies is just one of those things where it kind of it is like almost like the fallback mechanic for a lot. It's kind of like white black life gain, sure, that kind of thing. It's like it's like the fallback mechanic in in a lot of sets. So there are a lot of cards to support it, and that's one of the reasons why it is relatively budget like in that deck i do think this is actually quite powerful just like oh yeah for being sure. able to play cards on the top of your library is very dumb and like and and you being able to play them with flash as well this will be fantastic in that in that in that kind of deck so if there's something you're supporting in your cube i would definitely have a look at Aaron and giada oh yeah no absolutely if you have like 10 cards for sets i think it's it's pretty strong and you could get higher than that even um and a blue white flyers deck will will mostly have a fairly low curve as well which which makes um this sort of effect even more powerful because you can kind of train cards together um obviously uh gets better with cards like uh, brainstorm or top or whatever but, but manipulate the top of your library as well um but yeah no if if, if that is a sport of theme in a, in your cube um yeah maybe a more budget one then um then it seems really good shame it's not uncommon it would be it seems it seems great in peasant cube it would um, be phenomenal yeah and that i just just cut just color it in silver it'll be fine no one yeah. <laughs> all right next up we have galter and maverin it is three green green white white for a 12 12 legendary creature dinosaur vampire it has trample and whenever you attack choose one Create a tapped and attacking XX green dinosaur creature token with trample, where X is the greatest power among other attacking creatures. Or create X11 white vampire creature tokens with lifelink, where X is the number of other attacking creatures. So this is a lot of power and toughness. Like, what's this? Seven mana for 12 12 trample with the possible upside if you have some other creatures attacking to either make another big dumb green dinosaur uh, with trample, which we'd like, or to go wide with the board, maybe if your opponent had blockers maybe i'm like the we'll get to kind of which one to go for in a minute but like for me this is this is a card that you're cheating into play um so you're either sneak attacking it in you're, you're reanimating it or because it's green it is a natural order target um that part is good it is a shame this has just come after a set where we've had a traxer um which does all of that and draws you three to four cards this is still a 12-12 and will hopefully be cheaper. So there is definitely potential where if you're looking for a slightly more budget version of a Traxxer, this could be the card for you. It fills a lot of holes. Like it being able to it being able to be a target for natural order is very nice. Um while also going with all the other things. In terms of when you attack, which ones you make, I'm assuming it kind of depends on the size of the other creature that you're that you're attacking. Because unfortunately, if you attack with just this. You get a zero zero green dinosaur which dies straight away, or you create zero one one vampire creature tokens. Unfortunately, it is other attacking creatures. Um, so I think I think crucially the, the second part, the tokens. If you make multiple small vampires, the tokens are not attacking. So I think mostly the rule is if you need to block, you are making a bunch of one ones. Oh, okay. That yeah. Okay, I'll be honest. Didn't clock that. Thank you. <laughs> good, good, nice. So there, um, there is some talk of people people playing this in Pioneer. 
because of its interaction with Sorin Imperius Bloodlord. That lets you put a vampire from your hand into play as early as well. It 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 Sorin is a three mana planeswalker. You can, in theory, if you have this in hand, it is a vampire. You could put it to, into play on turn three. Whether you're already running Sorin Imperius Bloodlord in your cube slightly unlikely unless you are supporting your vampires theme but it is a nice interaction um it is something that people are trying to do some cool things with so probably worth mentioning what do you think james what, uh, what do you think of galton and, and maverin even though i will admit maverin's not really bringing much to the party with this it doesn't need to do much on the big dinosaur yeah, he's he's letting it letting Sorin put him into play, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he's, he's had a word with his buddy Sorin down the pub. And, he's connected, uh, I like yeah, it. Yeah, 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 he's the fixer, I think. <laughs> and uh, and Galt is very much for muscle. Um, yeah, no. Um, I mean, listen, seven's a lot for this, isn't it? Um, it's seven mana. Um, it is worth noting. It is worth noting. It is when you attack. It's not when this attacks. So like you can play this pre-combat and like attack with something else, and you get a little bit of value. But um, uh, okay. You compare this to the sevens that are available in for cubes. You know, like Avenger of Zendikar, whatever. Just uh, to pull one out of a hat. But there's um, yeah. But there are better seven drops in this set, I think, for for doing fair things with um. Yeah, like you're not sure of this and it, it lives, you'll you'll win. But um that's true of most of them. I I, I like the Soren thing. I think if you had uh if you had a vampire tribal deck, it would be quite funny to just like put this in as a random like <laughs> wombo combo with Soren. I think that's kinda of sweet. Um and you know, maybe sometimes it gets cast in a green white deck. Um but I think if you're just going on power level, there, there are better sevens. Nope, fair. I do want to take it away with our first Demir card. This seems right up your alley, James. Oh yeah, I'm quite excited about this one. Um, yeah, so we have a Halo Forager. This is one of blue and a black for a 3-1 creature fairy rogue. It has flying, and when Halo Forager enters the battlefield, you may pay X. When you do, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with mana value X from a graveyard, not just your graveyard, without paying its mana cost. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. Um, this is pretty strong, I think. Just like the body is already pretty legit. Like, three mana, three one flyer is a real clock. Um, like, if you have this and you have nothing else to do on turn three, this isn't like Snapcaster Mage where you hold it and try and get value. I think most of the time you'll just want to play it for that to get that, that clock going. Um, but later on, this is this is going to get some phenomenal value. The fact that it's either graveyard is like great flexibility. Um, yeah. Especially in Cube, where in theory there aren't any bad instant or sorceries. Exactly, exactly. Like, there'll be times where you just, you know, your opponent's a reanimator deck and you just, like, cast their reanimate. It's, <laughs> it's, it's going to be it's gonna be incredible. Um, but, yeah, no, I, 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 I kind of rate this card. Um, it is worth noting, as with all flashback effects, the ones that are sorcery speed, you have to be conscious of having the right instance and sorceries to flashback. Um, like, obviously, this doesn't work with counter spells. It doesn't work with, like, protection spells for example it's um you need stuff that you can cast on your turn um and will be effective on your turn um so think and obviously you want cheap spells um because if you try and cast flashback a four mana card with this that's going to cost you seven mana that's quite late in the game um so you want to be thinking along the lines of cheap removal spells discard spells and cantrips mostly um but if you have a decent density of those in your deck, I I think this is uh, I think this is pretty powerful. I I'm conscious that this is like exactly up my street, so I don't want to <laughs> like overdo it. You know, I'm not I'm not saying it's the best card in the set or anything, but I think it's like a pretty good role player. No, no, I I agree. This is a very strong card. I the there's a couple of issues that I have with it. Like I agree with everything you said. It's a very strong card, but um. Firstly, Demir is just a very hard guild to break into in terms of cube. Demir just has so many bangers. Um, for me, this will go into two types of cubes. It'll either go into peasant cube, 
because it is an uncommon, where it will be just an extremely powerful card there. Or it will go into the most powerful cubes where you can basically flash back things like Time Walk or Ancestral Recall. The, 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 the trouble I'm having with it is mine is, I guess, kind of in that chasm between them. And that's where I think it does have where it's trickier. Like, like if you are in like a, if your Demir deck is super controlly, this is fantastic. I think you run this, you have a great time with it. As you said, it can bring back your removal, it can bring back your cantrips, that kind of stuff. It's very, very good. But if you're in a kind of higher powered but not running power itself, I think this might struggle a little bit just because like there are just so many good Demir cards and you can't run all of them basically. Yeah, I think that's totally fair, to be honest. Um, I can't argue with any of that. Um, it's And I guess there are as well quite a lot of um, like very synergistic archetypes in Demir, like Reanimator, Storm, etc. This, this is much more of a value card. Um, yeah, I if put it in your pleasant group, it'll be fantastic. Um, yeah. No, 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 and, and I, this will be one they will put in the Mitgo Vintage Cube. I would highly anticipate. I mean, it's a new card, so it will, yeah. Yeah, it will be in for like two iterations of it, I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I will play it loads every time I see it. Yes, James, let's go. All right, <laughs> All right next up we have Iditsuku and Kairi. It is two blue-blue and a black for a 5-4 legendary creature, Ogre, Demon, Dragon. It has flying, and when it enters the battlefield, draw three cards, then put two cards from your hand on top of your library in any order. It also has, whenever it dies, exile the top card of your library. Target opponent loses life equal to its mana value. If it is an instant or sorcery card, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. So this is definitely another card that I think will struggle in higher powered cubes. But in more budget environments, I do actually think this card is quite good. Like, I actually think this is quite strong in... In those kind of budget lower powered builds, just just as a body, five four flying that brainstorms on ETB is actually going to be pretty good. Um, this card will play out probably better than I think it reads because basically you're manipulating the top of your library, and your p- opponent is kind of your opponent isn't really incentivized to kill it straight away because you could have stacked the top of your library with expensive spells that could just dome them for a bunch of damage. So. That there's tension there, like 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 they could just be waiting for you to draw those cards that you put on top before getting rid of this. Like that, like you could end up doming them for like five or six of this, which on top of this being a five four flyer could end up to being a lot of damage. I was actually t- I was actually talking with you, James, the other day about like a Esper Miracle styles deck where you kind of control the top of your, your library and use Miracle cards that cost cheaper if they're the first card you've drawn this turn. I think the archetype. Could be supported in higher power cubes. I don't think this card would get into that build if you were putting it in higher power cubes. But in more of like a budget environment, because the Miracles cards aren't actually super expensive. In that kind of build, the expensive cards will be like your Jace the Mind Sculptor and your Scroll Rack. We're not looking at those in budget cubes. But this could be one of the enablers for that, maybe. Um, while also just being a perfectly fine control win condition. Like that seems quite interesting to me. Um, what's your take? What do you think? Yeah, I quite I quite like this card. Um, one play pattern than like power level necessarily, um, and maybe slightly biased because it was the only good rare I got in my pre-release pool, so it's, uh, <laughs> I have an affinity for it already. Um, yeah, I think I think it's pretty. I think it has some stuff going for it. It is like it's a five mana value creature. Most of the time, we'll get onto the times where it's not, but most of the time it's a five mana value creature. And five mana is kind of a lot to play for a value creature, but like it's really big and it gets you a card. And then there's there's a certain amount of mind games here as well, right? With um with a brainstorm, like because like the way it reads, it's kind of telling you to put the best spell on the best instant or sorcery on top. And then if your opponent kills it, then um then you get your spell. But then your opponent knows this, and they, they can not play into you. They can wait until you untap, draw your card, attack with it, then kill it. Um, and then you get the second card you put back, which is presumably less good to hit, um, unless you, you manage to next level them somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, then you can do some unfair stuff with this, like especially if you have sack outlets in your deck um 
you can just try and combo this with something huge and get it straight away. Um, like, it doesn't even necessarily need to be a spell, because you get the damage, uh, even if it's not an instant or sorcery. Like, you can just put Emrakul on top, sack this 15 of them, and that's, that will win most. Yeah, that does seem pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, or if they've got, like, a bunch of super expensive, powerful instants and sorceries in the cube anyway, like, this seems like a nice little combo thing to do. Um, like, you know, say you, like, put time stretch on top, sacrifice this, they take 10 and you have two extra turns. You, that 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 seems like you should win from that point. Um, I'm, I'm quite on board with that. Like, obviously, this isn't, like, a combo thing for super high power cubes. Um, like, it's just a bit slower than, you know super high power reanimator or storm or console or whatever it might be but um you know people tend to think of q about it a lot of time as in like less powerful cubes are always fair and more powerful cubes are always comboy like you can put slightly less powerful less efficient combos in just because you're not going for cube on the power level of like vintage cube doesn't mean you just have to be playing a bunch of mid-range mirrors. Like, you can put combos in. I think this is a pretty cool one. Um, like, you probably want, like, other reasons to have the big spells in your deck, but it, it seems like it has potential to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, this is a cooler card than it is just raw power level, I think. Yeah, the, what, the, the play patterns and the tensions and stuff is is where this card, I think, will actually be quite fun. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had fun with it at pre-release. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to take it away uh, with our last battle? I think I'm going to say. Yeah, I think so. Um, next up is Invasion of New Phyrexia. It is X, a white, and a blue for a six defense battle. And when the Invasion of New Phyrexia enters the battlefield, you create X, two, two, white, and blue knight creature tokens with vigilance. So for four mana, you'd get two two twos. For five mana, you'd get three two twos. Scales like that, underwhelming at most points by cube power levels. However, if you can deal six damage to it, and then it will flip into Teferi Akosa of Zelfir, which is a legendary planeswalker Teferi. It starts with four loyalty and has the abilities plus one, draw two cards, then discard two cards, unless you discard a creature card. Minus two, you get an emblem with knights you control, get plus one, plus O, and have ward one. Or minus three, tap X creatures you control. When you do, shuffle target non-land permanent and opponent controls with mana value X or less into its owner's library. I think Teferi's really uh, had a career change here, hasn't he? Gone for... Yeah. <laughs> started hanging out with the knights and uh, and and got into all the, all the creature stuff. I, I don't think it's working out well for him so far, would be my take. I, I think this is the worst of the Teferi planeswalkers, certainly, by a lot. The, um, it's the front side of this is just a bit underwhelming at every point like yes as with all flex x spells the flexibility is great um however this this is just a bit too under the rate at every point for four really powerful cubes i think um you know the like if you're doing night tribal maybe this this makes it in um but even as like an opposition enabler or whatever i i think you can do better most of the time like it's a lot of stats, but it's just not winning the game fast enough, and and that's when you get to like five mana because it's it's pretty bad for four. Um, the backside, yeah, it's good, but like six is just so much defense. Um, like you really, that means you have to have been quite far ahead, really, and I don't think this is generally worth like you know, suiciding a bunch of your creatures in just to get this flipped, because you, you kind of still need to have a board for this to be good most of the time. Um, like, if you're behind, this this isn't fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm not super high on it. It's it's okay, you could put it in, but I don't think it's great. See, I actually think I'm a bit higher on this than you are. Like, I don't think it's, like, 
backbreakingly phenomenal, but I do think it's solid. Like with the front side, I think if you are paying five for it, so you're making three tokens, that is that is in theory the six power you need to flip this. Obviously, a game of magic has happened before that point. <laughs> Board states have happened. They don't have haste, you know. They have to like untap and do nothing for the turn so that that happened, right? No, I know. No, I know. I I do agree with that. But I, this card does have some flexibility. Like I could see this as a win condition in like a Azorius control deck where you kind of you just stopped everything they're doing, then you do this. The fact that they are tokens and this is very splashable does mean that there is some crossover with like a token deck. Like that is normally that like, is normally kind of like boris or maybe like azorius that kind of thing but there is a bit of crossover in that a lot of those token decks do already run things like like history of banalia which if you go like history of banalia on three this on turn four i do like a bit more like that could be quite strong and then you're going to get the permanent buff the worst teferi ever i would need to check on all the teferis i i I, i'm more you're more likely to see this in my cube than three mana teferi but that's because i just bloody hate three mana to fairy <laughs> i don't know what if i get to ten and add three mana to fairy <laughs> i might no I, I i reserve the right to say no so everyone listening in who is not aware um in my cube for every five cubes you win you get to add a card currently james is the only person to have done that feat feat and he added fast bond he's getting dangerously close but we're all doing our best to stop him especially if it means you add three mana to fairy like i will cut all the archetypes that you love and win with to stop <laughs> <thing happening. laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's a reasonable yeah. stance to take, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I could believe I'm a little bit low on this card. I, I think the issue I have with it is a control finisher, is it asks you to tap out on your turn. Like, for this to be powerful, it does. you need to tap all of your lands, right? You can't, like... Like, if you're playing it as a control finisher and you're like, oh, I want to, like, spend four mana on my turn and keep two mana up yeah. and it's not powerful enough right so you kind of have to like tap all your mana and then you're vulnerable to to whatever your opponent might do you can't leave interaction up um but yeah i could kind of i guess i could see it in a tokens deck or like i suppose in an opposition deck opposition does kind of also help it flip right you can yeah you can tap down um stuff. you yeah and because they have vigilance you can attack and then tap so maybe that's a home for it um and yeah, the, the, the planeswalker is powerful. Yeah, it's, it's it's just I just don't think the it's the floor of this. I don't think is that bad because like like I mean, this is not a great example because it has been cut from my cube. But like finale of glory wasn't there for quite a while, and this is basically that. But you pay a blue instead of the second white, and you have in theory the whole up, whole potential upside of the back of it. And like that was only cut when I took the aristocrat package out of my cube. Yeah, I didn't really like that one either. No, though. fair. Yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I'm maybe I'm just too low on this effect. I don't know. No, definitely, and it, and it is also like like I did not play against this at pre-release. <clears throat> Flip, like we're just getting used to playing battles. Battles into planeswalkers is a whole next level thing above that. So who knows? Maybe this card will break standard or something, and we'll be looking back on this in a year's time. Being yeah, come come tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, but. The battle things are hard to evaluate because there is an inherent difference between battles and planeswalkers where um, with a planeswalker, you the player defending it obviously chooses when they play it. So they will play it when they have their defenses up. Whereas you don't know when you're going to be asked to defend a battle. So it's um, it does make it a lot easier to get that damage in. But um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it seems seems playable. I've come around to playable. <laughs> Good, okay, we made it. All right, next we have Croxa and Kunaros. It is three red, white, and a black for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature, Elder Giant Dog. It has Vigilance, Menace, and Lifelink, and whenever Croxa and Kunaros enters the battlefield or attacks, you may exile five cards from your graveyard. When you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, at face value, this is just a very solid beta with a lot of stats and a lot of abilities um that is a very big life swing uh and it works on both attack and defense obviously with the vigilance and with the life link there um the fact it brings something with it is very good but this to me doesn't just get in if you're just doing fair things with it like like we do not want to be 
casting this in our Mardu deck for six. That's not where this lies. So to me, this is either a reanimator target or a sneak attack target that brings something else back also big and huge with it from the graveyard. Um, there is also some combo potential with this card um, with when you combine this with Altar of Dementia. Basically, if you have them both... It, basically, if you have Altar of Dementia in play and you play this, um, you sacrifice Croxa and, and Kunaros to the altar with the end of the battlefield trigger on the stack. So Crox and Kunaros goes to the graveyard. You've milled your six cards from the altar. Then you can exile five of the cards that you've exiled from your graveyard and bring this back with its own end of the battlefield effect. Basically, you can do that infinitely to mill your whole library. And then I'm kind of assuming on the last turn around, you can bring back a Thassa's Oracle will win the game that way or another way of winning when you have no uh, library, basically. Um, this is not as good as Demonic Consultation, but it is at least more interesting. I will give it that. Um, if it sees playing cube, I think it is for that interaction, just combined with like being a cool reanimation target. Like It is an interesting card, and it is interesting in that reanimation. It is a bit more kind of fun than like Grizzlebrand, even though Grizzlebrand is way more powerful. This is kind of... You can do some cool stuff with this, maybe not as just raw power level. Um, but yeah, three-color creatures are very hard to justify if you are casting them, but if you're not casting them, I like them a lot more. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i pretty... I agree with all of that. I think it's a, I think it's a really cool card. Um, the altar combo's really sweet, um, and it's like a way to do fast as Oracle stuff that isn't completely degenerate and wins on turn three. Um, which is pretty interesting. The yeah, obviously I don't think this is good enough for like the highest power level cubes, but um I think there's a lot of space in slightly lower power level cubes that this could be a really interesting one. Yeah, also interesting in reanimator, like you basically double up your reanimation spell, right? If you have a sufficiently stocked graveyard, what this says is in opposed to just reanimating the one thing I'm getting back with this. I get that thing, and I get this 6-6 six, six Vigilance Menace Lifelink, because I reanimate the Croaks, and the Croaks are being back for the other thing. Um, so that's pretty strong. Um, like, six, it's huge, and the Lifelink actually matters a lot. It makes it like, if they can't kill this, they can't really attack you on the ground and try and kill you with creature combat. Um, the, I, I don't like it as a sneak attack target, because... Um, for me, a lot of the advantage of like a sneak attack over a reanimate type deck is that with my sneak attack deck, I don't have to worry about filling up my graveyard. I just I can just play more of a control game and um, and combine my two cards in hand. I don't need to be stocking up my graveyard as well. And this asks you to put out like a lot of cards in your graveyard. Um, so that seems kind of tough. I don't think five is too much to ask like well it's it's six right because it's also the thing you're returning oh that's true yeah, um, yeah it's one more yeah that's fair yeah but it, but you just but you do need the target specifically in there right like you need this in hand and sneak attack in play and the target in your graveyard yeah, yeah you, you're you bringing back the previous thing you sneak attacked the sure. previous turn <laughs> i'm kind of assuming i've already won but um yes that's fair yes but yeah no I, but i think yeah all the other use cases i like quite a bit um yeah say so probably not one for super high power level cube but goes on some of the ones and like and yes it's hard to cast but it's not like uncastable in the way that a gristle brand or an archon is like it's you, you will get there some games even if you're not like call those calls you know say you're like grixis you can just put like one or two white dual lands in your deck and, and sometimes you'll cast that and it'll be pretty good. Although the, the one thing I will say that bothers me is that um, I'm pretty sure first time round Kunaro stopped creatures coming back from your graveyard. It seems like a bit of a fail <laughs> to me. I think it did I actually, know. yeah. It was for free free, right? But maybe maybe there are some story permutations where Yeah, creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. That seems, I would say, quite desperate with this this ability. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, they've teamed up with Croxa, who does come back, so maybe. Yeah. 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 There's definitely when the invasion tree reached the underworld, it found only fury and uh, it found only teeth and fury. Yeah. So I guess the Phyrexians pissed them off enough that 
<laughs> the dog got annoyed. <laughs> yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Just don't put original Kunaros in your Croxer and Kunaros deck. It won't work well. Yeah, do not do that. Yeah. Cool. Um, next up, we have Rankle and Torbram. This is one black, black, red, red for a legendary creature fairy dwarf. It's a 3-4 with flying first strike and haste. And it has whenever Rankle and Torbrand deals combat damage to a player or battle, choose any number. Each player creates a treasure token. Each player sacrifices a creature. And if a source you control would deal damage to a player or battle this turn, it deals that much damage plus two instead. So the key with this card, or a lot a lot of it is the, the first strike works really well this ability, right? Because you um especially with a dealing two more, because you get to deal your first strike damage with this. If you choose that ability, then all your other creatures without first strike will deal two extra damage. That's really nice. Um and this also just makes combat and have suit nightmare for your opponent. Like if you can't block this, trying to line up your blocks with the other attacking creatures and not getting in a world of hurt to them choosing the right combination of these, like with like making you edict away a key blocker or whatever seems uh seems challenging for the for blocking player. But this um the issue I have with it is just the mana cost really. Like is so color intensive and for five this is you know it's it's powerful but is it so much more powerful than say a gold span dragon or a glory bringer but i wouldn't just rather have the card that's really easy to cast um it's kind of unclear to me that this is uh that this is even better than those cards even if i could always cast it and it's yeah that mana cost very real, even if you're straight red black, which is um, you know, not a super popular color combination in in a lot of cubes, and um, also not known for its fixing. Not known for its fixing, and like the times where you draw like one swamp and four mountains, it's just gonna feel so bad. Um, and I yeah, I just don't know. You're really getting paid enough. What do you think? Yeah, no, I can really, I can really agree. The like th this is oddly harder to cast than like the three color spells that we've like the, the three color spells with like single pips in them that we like 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 Bubba Rigamus that we've seen like this is actually going to be trickier to cast i do think it is a powerful effect but again yeah just when you're listing off other five drops you could run like the note i have is like oh the bottom ability is like hell rider but it's harder to cast yeah and you have to actually deal the damage to a player not the attack and it's like it does like all the abilities on this i like like every every part of, every part of this card i do like it's just yeah, it's a bit too much of a faff to cast, I think, and that's kind of that will really struggle to make it kind of see a lot of play, I would say. Yeah, I was thinking the one place I could kind of see it being interesting is if you have, um, and this is very niche. If mm -hmm. I love niche, James, I love niche. If you would have like a lot of treasury shenanigans where you're sacrificing your artifacts um, and a lot of treasure support, like. This kind of works all the ways you want with it, right? Because your treasures, A, help you cast this a lot more consistently. Um, it makes a treasure. And that last ability is going to go great with a bunch of the stuff in that deck. Like, treasure goes great with you know, your Mayhem Devils and your Disciple of the Vaults and whatnot. They're often the pair. Oh, but like, fair. Mayhem Devil, if you can trigger this last ability, that's really powerful, right? Your Mayhem Devil does free every time you sack a treasure. That sounds like it could win some games. But um, yeah, this is probably like kind of niche. So it does also, actually, now I'm looking at it, because it says source, it does also kind of make your burn spells cost like two more damage as well. Like, obviously, it has to deal damage, but flying first strike haste, it will probably do that. So yeah, yeah, it's it, it's tough. I, I like it. It's a powerful card. But yeah, it's just, it will struggle to see your home. One card that might not struggle to find a home is Thalia and the Git Rod Monster. It is one white, black, and a green for a 4 4 legendary creature, Human Frog Horror. It has First Strike and Death Touch, and the abilities you may play an additional land on each of your turns. Creatures and non basic lands your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped, and when Thalia and the Git Morg attacks, sacrifice a creature or land, then draw a card. So, 
ignore everything else I've said about three color cards being difficult or not worth casting. Um, this is the exception for me. Um, this is a three color card that I'm perfectly fine trying to hard cast. Um, First Strike and Death Touch is a miserable combination for your opponents. Like anything scrapping with this in combat is just dead. For those not aware, the way that works is obviously Death Touch kills something the moment it deals combat damage to it. First Strike will deal damage to it before the opposing creature has the chance to deal damage to you, so it just dies immediately in First Strike. So Thalion the Get Rock Monster is fantastic at rumbling and getting in for some damage and also on blocking duties as well. All the abilities as well, I think, are just very good. Um, playing extra lands a turn is great. That goes in so many decks, like not not just landfall decks, but just like slower controlly decks where you're just playing you're just playing your lands to kind of um, ramp up your next big thing. Um, the slowdown ability is a really big tempo swing. Like the three mana Thalia doesn't see that much play, but that ability is still very good. And when it's on this body, it's much better. Um, just because this creature will hold down the board, it will catch up if you're behind, and then everything else your opponent does from then on is going to be slower. And then the sacking your stuff to draw cards is the card advantage that you kind of need to kind of push you in to the late game. Um, the home for this is a little bit harder, but then maybe it just goes in any deck that could feasibly splash for it. That might so I could see like a death and taxes in like white black. Uh, splashing green for this um it could just be in a white green kind of monster cell deck splashing black like, like it, but basically basically if your mana base can support it there could be an argument that you play it um we have done some testing with this in my cube since it's been spoiled i will be honest i don't think i've seen it cast it's been drafted and players have had it in their decks and I'm not just sure if this is a new card and it hasn't found a place yet, or it's because the three colours actually are restrictive enough for it to not get in. So firstly, James, what do you think about the card? And then secondly, what do you think about the fact that we haven't actually seen it do too much, even though it's been in for about two or three drafts now? Yeah, I mean, I agree it's super powerful. Um, I wonder if there's a bit of... Um, because it's an obviously powerful new card, people take it quite highly. Um and then when they finish drafting their deck, they realize, oh, it doesn't actually quite fit, you know? Um, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, it, it doesn't... Yeah, it, that is the challenge, right? Is just getting it into your deck. If you get it into your deck and on the battlefield, it's going to do good things for you. Um, I think I'm slightly lower than you on the um, creatures entering tapped bit, just because... Um, I see that much more as an aggressive ability because it just it only stops creatures blocking a turn they enter, right? It, it doesn't actually stop them attacking you unless they have haste. Yeah, that's fair. Because they, they enter tap, they, they untap and attack you. But um, and and you can't really block this anyway because it has first strike and death touch for some incredible reason. Um, yeah, you you to to trade with this with non first strike creatures, you would need to block it with five four power creatures, which seems very difficult to do. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty high on the card, honestly. It's um, the abilities, the other two abilities work really nicely together. The um, because sacking your lands is obviously you know you're you're going down mana is worth noting. That's not a may, um. But you will make up for that because presumably you're just drawing a normal proportion of lands off the top. Um, you will find lands to replace the lands you've sacrificed. Um, also, no, it's worth, worth noting it's great with any sort of uh, like Ren 6 type stuff. For the saying you get lands back from your graveyard because you'll have the extra land drop. You can play those lands again straight away. Um, yeah, I, I think. I think this goes in a lot of decks, like most decks that can cast it will be pretty happy with this card. Um, the that can cast it thing is a challenge, but like I'll even pretty happily splash this as in like a uh, like a Omnath deck, you know, like I'll I'll just I'll just put a couple of black horses in and like if you have a bunch of fetch lands you can find them, right? Yeah, like like one of your triumphs in that kind of five colour in that kind of four four colour deck might just tap for black anyway and then you have access to this so exactly yeah yeah um yeah and i could yeah you, i could certainly see yeah as you splash it in your like white black deck even that's that's completely fine you it's one of those cards where because there's so much power there it 
it's okay if you're not like maximizing every ability on the card. No, exactly. Um, yeah, if you can just cast it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I, ge I guess the only thing you'd have against it is, um, you know, it's a four mana creature. It doesn't do that much for turn it enters. Um, like, it gives you an extra land drop, sure, but they, yeah, if they kill it, it's not like it has a great ETB or anything. But yeah, when you get to swing for it, it's, it's pretty powerful. An incredible blocker. Uh, next up, we have Slimefoot and Squee. It is a black, a red, and a green for a legendary creature fungus goblin. It's a 3-3, free free, and it has whenever Slimefoot and Squee enters the battlefield or attacks, create a 1-1 green sapling creature token. And it has an activated ability of sacrifice a sapling, return Slimefoot and Squee and up to one other target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery. Um, I have heard this card described as a recurring nightmare on a stick. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna have to push back against it. Um, so I think, like, I I do think this is a potentially powerful card, but it does need quite a bit of setup. Um, it would weirdly, it would be way better if you could activate the ability from play, um, as what well, like to just sacrifice a sapling and get one other thing back as well as being able to activate it from the graveyard. Because um, the thing is, like, sure you can put it in your graveyard, but it's quite hard to have a sapling to sacrifice if this hasn't entered the battlefield. Like, yeah, if you exactly. Just... It needs to go th through play to the battlefield to do the thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um. Yeah, you want to be like playing this, making some saplings, then it goes to a graveyard, um, which is obviously like doable. Like you can ha put sacrifice outlets in your deck, um, and at some point, if you just keep attacking with it, like your opponent will probably have to block it and kill it because like it's getting you one ones every time. So eventually, that will get there, but um, it's not gonna. You're not gonna be like activating this on turn four very much. There's just quite a lot of hoops you have to jump through um i will say this actually gets way way better if you have any ways to put other saplings into play um preferably relatively early i think like literally mutable is probably the best one <laughs> um, but you know if you can because in that spot you can um it is incredible with stuff like fauna shaman uh survival of vitus type stuff right you um like you survival for this um, then you just discard this right away to your survival, survival for a big thing, discard that. Um, and then you can just, you know, say you have a mutable, you activate, obviously this is probably over a turn or two, but you can just activate your mutable, sack it to this ability, return this and the giant thing that you got. And it's kind of like a one card combo, which like you just needed to draw survival on a creature and then you can like chain through all of that. And that's really nice because I don't think we really have, um, that's quite a unique effect. We've not had stuff that can, like, a creature that can reanimate other stuff from the graveyard. Like, we've got, like, a burial right? but you obviously that's that's not a creature, so this opens you up to, like, more of that tutory stuff. Um, and that's kind of powerful. Um, but there really aren't a lot of saplings. It's, it's the tricky bit. Um, no, I, I generally am on Scryfall right now. and ooh, I, I, think, I think the other one I've, like, seen in cubes is tender shoot dryad makes sapling tokens um and i think really the home for this you know it's not in a like you're not like trying to turbo to that ability and reanimate something massive really you're trying to you're playing it in like an aristocracy deck where you're like already happy with this just entering making fuel you sack your dudes you've got one one so that's kind of what you need in most decks you just need bodies a lot of the time and then slightly later on, when this has just gone to a graveyard to have killed it or you've sacrificed it or whatever, because um, you'll have other sacrifice outlets in your deck, then you can start doing this like recursive value engine. And that's that's actually really strong. Um, so if you have like an aristocrat's deck in this color, uh, I, I actually think this is a pretty strong inclusion. But um, I think it is only for that spot. No, that's actually really interesting because I one of the reasons why I end up cutting Aristocrats, because mine was in Mardu, which is kind of, four cube is the more traditional build of it, but just like in terms of like decks that exist out there, like I'm, I, I'm looking at kind of like Canadian Highlander lists, not so much in modern anymore, but kind of like 
seeing people seeing what people are building with the current cards out there. Aristocrats is more Jundy now because like you want to be running like Corvold and like you have plenty of like good token makers in green. So that is actually quite interesting. Um, specifically with Slimefoot and Squee, like for me, like yeah, I was I was also I, I was more hyped about this card when uh, it was um, compared to Recurring Nightmare. I will be honest with you, but I do. Yeah, just from reading it, just there is multiple things you have to do to really get the most value out of this card. This is another card from this set, and this is one thing about this set that I'm actually quite impressed by. Is that this is a phenomenal set for more budget environments because effectively, like I, I know this is not recurring nightmare, but it does an impression of it. We do like the uh, like the classic combination with recurring nightmare in cube is recurring nightmare and survivor of the fittest. Um, what do you call it? Fauna Shaman did just get reprinted and is now relatively cheap. So, which means that for a relatively cheap cost, you can have a version of that in your budget cube. So, you can run something like Slimefoot and Squee and Fauna Shaman and have a yes, it is not recurring nightmare survival of the fittest, but in that budget level, in that budget power level, in that budget build, it'll probably be a good power level for it. It'll let you do some cool things. It'll let you kind of have a version of it well without spending however much money survival of the fittest is now and that kind of stuff like i think that like i actually think that would be really fun and kind of yeah, yeah this is one of the things i'm very impressed by with this set is, is there's a lot of cool cards for lower powered level cubes which will let you do a lot of cool cool and interesting things and i think this is a great example of that yeah yeah, yeah no for sure um I, I think the bit of nightmare that it does do assuming you have another sacrifice out there is the like unbeatable late game value bit yeah um it's not doing anything quickly, but um, you know, unless they can exile this, and it's if you have sacrifice outlets, you can't really exile it from play. If you know, they'll point a swords at it and you just sacrifice it, um, and yeah, it's you will just keep being able to recur your best thing and your slime foot, and that'll be be pretty hard to grind through in a long game. Um, but yeah, doing and you know, early it's. You know, assuming the mana works, it is like a free, free for free that like gets you some value and it gets you some bodies. So I, I do, I do think it's pretty strong if your cube supports it. Nice. All right, moving on to our last card and our only artifact for the day, we have Sword of Once and Future. Uh, they are completing the cycle uh, of the swords. It is three generic mana for an artifact equipment. Importantly, it has equip two. Equipped creature gets plus two plus two and has protection from blue and from black. And whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, surveil two. Then you may cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value two or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. So we'll talk about the card itself before we go into whether it's playable or not. Um, Pro black is especially good with these kind of things because black has a lot of removal it having pro blue as well means it can't be bounced, that kind of stuff. Um, the abilities of the card are all very good. Surveilling two and then letting you fueling your graveyard so you can cast um, instant or sorceries from it. It's very good. This is all good abilities. This is still very, very unplayable though. Um, as we said before, when we spoke about the la- uh, sword, I think in the last set or the one before, it's basically a five drop that requires you to have a creature that you can connect to your opponent with to do anything i have cut all the swords from my list and i guarantee no one has noticed <laughs> yeah and i think they're almost all better than this one as well <laughs> oh really i i i would say of the swords i would put this like fourth or fifth maybe i think the like i quite like those abilities like i quite like those abilities but i just don't like the fact that even once you've got like it's already loads of setup to connect with your sword, as you said, you spend oh, loads true. of mana. And then you need the more setup. Of... Yeah, then there's like you yeah, need yeah. more things to be getting right. Um, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't think swords are where it's at really anymore. Um, like sword of fire and ice specifically is like quite a good little um, like doesn't need anything. It's it can be powerful in a slow matchup, but um. Did you notice I cut that from my cube like three months ago? No, I didn't. To be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not wrong. Um, 
I would say the only reason to put this in your cube is I bet there's someone out there who wants all 10 swords in their cube and is being a completionist and more power to you. Um, this, is the this, is, this is the last one, right? I, I believe so. completed the cycle. Um, yes, I believe we have all the swords now. Yeah, which must be sort of the longest running cycle in, in the history of magic, I'd imagine. Um, Ooh, I don't know. There's definitely some land cycles I want them to finish from like donkeys years ago oh uh, sure yeah, yeah yeah give me more uh, cross and verges yes <laughs> perfectly reasonable um yeah no i i i'm pretty off it um it's too much mana to play and equip swords now it's just a bit slow there will be cubes with kind of equipment sub themes who are tempted by the swords but even then there are still just so many other good bits of equipment that you probably should consider running first that just do more like all of the swords, I think, are powerfully under cards like Shadow Spear, like Umazawa's Jitte, Batter Skull, and Cauldra Complete. Like these, the next tier are ones I am running in my cube over the swords. Like I, I would rather run Bone Splitter; it'll do more. Um, I like Heirloom Blade, Nettle Cyst, and even like Lizard Blades. I think are more interesting and kind of just. There's definitely an argument with like that second tier that they don't have the raw power level, but over the course of the game of Magic, they will they will deal more damage to your opponent and they will do more things reliably, is where I'm going with that. Yeah, and I, I think the thing I love about both of those cards is that they're also just creatures. Um, and if you're doing an equipment theme, often the problem is like you've you, you want to maximize the number of equipment in your deck so that your equipment payoffs all get better, but you also need a bunch of creatures because you need stuff to attach your equipment to. And those cards fill both of those roles, which is great. And they don't ask any more of you. They don't have to be equipped before they do anything. Whereas this is like, you have to pay three mana to play it. It does nothing until you pay two mana to equip it. They kill your creature in response. You're just down such a tremendous amount of mana. Um, you just can't spend that long anymore, I don't think, in most cubes. Um, yeah, I think for, for equipment decks, you tend to want the cheaper equipment that are cheaper to equip so you can get more of your equipped creatures and start getting your payoffs. Like, you don't want to be playing, like, this really clo slow clunky one just for a bit more a bit more raw power level when it is equipped. No, no, 100%, yeah. Unfortunately, the dawn has set on the swords of Incube. It was good while they lasted, I guess, is that... <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah i always felt like they were a bit overrated but yeah. yes <laughs> no, uh, but but again they are cool we cannot they are cool yeah they are cool we do like them they'll they'll still see playing commander where they'll do some dumb things so right so that brings us to the end of all the cards um yeah i think it's been a really interesting set with a lot of cool cards with for a number of different archetypes, and especially for different budgets and different power levels. There's a lot of cool cards there. Before we get you out of here, me and James are going to go over what our favorite five cards from the set are. We'll talk a little bit about them, but it's just generally, yeah, just gauge what we think and what we like and what we expect to kind of see in cubes, either in my own or like on like the Mego Vintage Cube or just out in the wild. So, James, you want to take it away with your number five? My number five is one that I think might be surprising that it's not higher, but I think we kind of covered a couple of the reasons why. It is Falia and the Gitrog monster. Um, yes, yeah, super powerful effect. Um, if it hits the battlefield, it's going to do a lot. Um, the, the abilities have nice synergy upside, but with the... Um, but it's rarely going to be bad if you can play it and attack with it. Um, the only reasons it's not higher is just um, free colors really limits what decks it goes in and um, and doesn't give you immediate value most of the time. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. So my number five might also be a little bit surprising. Um, I've chosen a battle. I have gone with Invasion of Ikoria. I think the effect it has is one that we want in a lot of cubes, like the X green green, go and get a card out of your deck. Like that, the base level of that is just so good. But the potential upside of this card, I think, is huge. Like I played against this at pre-release, 
um and i was sweating bullets when this came down like i just def- like it was the f- it was the only time in any battle i was like i have to defend this for my life otherwise i am just dead there's no way i'm winning the game so that threat of flipping it like yes it is six but the threat of doing it of getting it flipped is really huge and the added co- potential combo ability of doing it with um vampire hex mage i do think could be quite cool i think for that reason it comes it's it's it's, it's, it's quite an easy one to slot into a lot of cubes already and for me that's why i put it on my as my number five cool um yeah that makes a lot of sense to me um it was be definitely if we did a top 10 it would be in my top 10 just it didn't quite make the cut um cool yeah my number four i have gone for vampaging raptor which is the red 4-4 with haste and trample and some other abilities. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's how we should read all the cards, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, this is this does a lot. This, I think, is a pretty big upgrade. It goes in multiple decks. Like, if you're red and aggressive, you want this. You want this in mono-red, and you want it in, like, red-green monsters. Um yeah, I'm pretty into this one. I, f- I think this is going to see a lot of play. It rewards you for accelerating it out early. It's a beast at any point in the game, and it's going to, and even later in the game, it scales with that pump ability. It kills planeswalkers right to death. You're, I, I think you're going to be pretty happy with this in a lot of decks. Nice. Yeah, very solid card. Um, my number four, uh, I've gone for Elish Norn. Um, this card just seems just generically super powerful. Like, I don't really think, like, there are synergies you can do with it. It works better in some decks than others, but just curve out and play this and you'll probably win the game. I, it's, yeah, super strong. The front side is just going to be very annoying with the, like, the, this card will teach us just the amount of sources that deal damage in a turn that kind of thing because the amount of times we'll be asking to be paid the one and then if you can flip it you're just winning the game that backside is super scary so yeah it had to be on my list yeah no i'd buy that and the the conditions to flip it are not nearly as restrictive as a lot of appraisers cool well my number three i have gone for fairy mastermind um the yuta takahashi world card i i think this card's pretty powerful and it's so efficient um i think that flash you're gonna get a lot of people um anyone who's played with uh leopold or narset knows how you're it's always shocking how many ex- additional cards people draw in a normal or would normally draw in a normal game of cube uh fairy mastermind doesn't stop from drawing those cards but it gives you value when they do and that's so much to get on top of a just a 2-1 flyer for two. That's such a good tempo creature. It's going to threaten Planeswalkers. You can be able to get it out early. The Flash is really good because you can play it in response to them doing it, casting a Ponder or whatever. So you can get immediate value. Or you can just leave up your other interaction. You don't have to tap out and commit to a board. And then in their end steps, you can Flash that in if you have a mana available. Um and plus it has an activated ability that can be strong later in the game. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a really nice, flexible card for going a lot of blue decks. Yep, I agree with everything you said so much. It is also my number three. I think it just it just slots into blue twos so nicely. Like I do think it is slightly better in like the more kind of like tempo y style of style of builds rather than just like the control, but I like that aspect of cube, and I think it's definitely something that my cube personally has kind of moved a bit too away from. So I'm happy to bring this in and kind of bring a bit more tempo back to the environment. But yeah, I think it's a very strong card. Nice. Yeah. Um, Cool. My number two, I have gone for Blood Feather Phoenix. This is the one red 2-2 flyer that can come back from your graveyard when your instants and sorceries deal damage from. I think this is like a card that goes in basically every cube with a mono red deck would be my take. Um, I think this is a pretty big upgrade over a lot of the red 2 drops that see a lot of play in most cubes. Um like just that evasion is something that Red doesn't normally get at that early stage of the curve. Um and late game it's just gonna make every 
bolt every chain lightning, every shock that you draw off the top into an absolute house. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a pretty exciting card. Yeah, so not only is our number three the same, our number two is the same. I'm also half guessing our number one is the same too. But let's talk about Bloodfeather Phoenix as well. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. I think it's a fantastic card. And just for me, just going through and just doing the maths of like just in in my cube, I have 12 ways of getting this back. I think you only need to get it back once. And you're incredibly happy with that. Just It's just a great way of killing an opponent in a mono red deck. Like, it's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I agree completely with what you said. It's this is going to be a staple in any cube with mono red. It is just that strong. Oh yeah, for sure. I'll also give a honourable mention here to Kenra Spellseer. If I, I couldn't quite stomach putting two aggressive red two drops in, <laughs> in my top five, but uh, so I might have made the cut otherwise. Um, yes, definitely, definitely. Red Echo got some tools here. Um, cool. Yeah, well, my number one, I'm not sure will surprise you, it is the Chrome Host Siege, Siege Shark. Very weird card name, but fantastic card. Um, this is so solid. They're like two, four bodies, great with flying. There's so many ways to abuse it with like Force of Will, with Treasure Cruise, with all of these cards that um, have a higher CMC than the amount of mana you're going to pay for them. And you don't even need to be abusing it, I don't think, really. Like, there's also there's also a bunch of synergy with just even if the artifacts you're making have a very small number of plus one plus one counters, they're still just artifacts that are lying around. Blues has loads of ways to use those. If you combine this with Urza or something like that, it can be fantastic. Um, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about this card. I think it goes in a lot of blue decks. Yep, it is good to know that great minds think alike, James. Our top three is identical. My number one is also Chrome Host Seed Shark. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. It's just, it just, it does so much just by rewarding you for just playing Magic. Like, all you have to do is cast this and just play the rest of the game of Magic, and you will have these incubate tokens that you can use for artifact synergies, or you can just pay to and flip them and kill your opponent with them. Like, yeah, I think it's a phenomenal card, and I I could see the top three or like our joint top three, Fairy Mastermind, Bloodfeather Phoenix, and Chrome Ho Sea Shark being staples of Cube for quite a bit of time. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um yeah, I think you know, we talked about a lot of powerful cards, especially in the, the gold section. Um and I think the difference between Chrome Ho Sea Shark and those cards is there was a lot of if you're doing this, if you're in that deck, if you have these things to support it. Chrome Ho Sea Shark just needs you to play magic. Like, uh, sure, technically it's not great in your like super creature heavy deck, but let's be real, we're, we're playing blue here. We're playing good <laughs> sorcerers. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really good value creature. Yeah, love it. I uh, fortunately opened one at pre-release. It'll be in the next cube. Don't worry. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Well, James, thank you again very much for uh, joining me for these set reviews. It's always great to have you here. You add a great level of insight. Uh, thank you so much, dude. Yeah, no problem. Always a pleasure. Um, can never, can't get too tired of about chatting about cube really. So yeah, uh, all good. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you all very much for watching and listening. Do make sure you like, share, and subscribe, all that good stuff, so you are notified when any other Cube content comes out on the channel. Until next time, it's goodbye from me and James, and we'll see you all soon. Goodbye. <laughs>